It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the renowned Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great today, Andy. Ready to leap in my first adventure in the beautiful world of literature as a kid. This is this was the first time I was ever absolutely gripped uh, by a novel. So let's get to it. Yeah, I I understand. I mean, uh, it wasn't the first time for me, but when I when I first read Tolkien, I mean, I, this is just great. I, you know, as a I, I, as an inveterate hero worshiper. You know the heroism of, of Tolkien's world is just grand scale, and it, it's just yeah, it gripped me as a kid. I, I came back to it later as an adult, reread it, still love it. Uh, really, really like Peter Jackson's movie versions of it. You know, uh, and so mm -hmm. I'm glad P I'm glad Peter Jackson was able to do that and possibly bring uh, Tolkien. A lot of times when a movie is popular, it, it leads people back to the books. And I hope, yes. hope Peter Jackson's film, you know, led a, a younger generation of readers who may not have read Tolkien previously back to the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. This is great stuff and uh, high time uh, for Tolkien to be celebrated on the on the hero show. The world of Bilbo yeah. Baggins and so on. Yeah, let's do it. So let me just start, Andy. I'm freshman in high school in New York City. And a friend of mine has a dungaree jacket and on the bottom of the back of it, this is when they used to have like rock bands and beautiful images. And on the bottom of it, it says Lord of the Rings. And, and I ask him, Chris, what does that mean? And he tells me, Robert, you can't be a total Led Zeppelin and Rush fans, which I was of both of them, without knowing the Lord of the Rings. So I go home that night and I see on my brother Damien's library, he has all three volumes and I read it. I fall behind in my schoolwork. We're supposed to be reading like Thomas Hardy and Edith Wharton for required reading. And I'm in lost in the world of, of Lord of the Rings. And my good friend, Gerard Vignulli would refer to me as Bilbo Baggins Begley. That was like my nickname. Uh, well, you know, you know Robin, you, you, Robin, you, you're dating yourself when these guys are, you guys are reading Thomas Hardy in English classes in public high school back then. I mean, uh, yeah. oh God, they probably have, haven't read Thomas Hardy in the high schools now in decades. It was way over the Yeah, years. maybe not. But the teacher did not like that. I wasn't as focused on that because I was, I, I was totally absorbed in the world of Tolkien. So uh, it's, as I said, it's just been a big part of my life. And, and we have the moral, you know, the moral conflict here in the story. And that's one, you know, one aspect that's uh, completely gripping. It's clearly good versus evil mm -hmm. in this saga. Yeah, and the backstory, as, as, as we're introduced to, you know, there's a, a mystery about Sauron, you know, and his, all of his evil deeds way in the past. And is he still around? You know, is he still this arch villain orchestrating all kinds of evil events? And, and the way Tolkien tells it, you know, with the, with the hob the characters of, of the hobbits and the, and the ring of, the ring of power. Now it's a long time since I read read The Hobbit, the story of, of Bilbo Baggins, but that's where the ring that's where the ring is first uh, introduced, right? And Bilbo Bilbo gets it yes. in in that in that in that battle they have. Um, what's the what's the name of the dragon in The Hobbit? I forget the I forget the dragon's name. Smaug. Smaug. That's Smaug. Right. Well, Smaug. Yeah, S M A U G. Right. Yeah, you can't beat Tolkien for names, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Smaug, Smaug, right? But Bilbo gets the ring, right? In it's in in those in those adventures, and and you know the the Hobbit. I think didn't Tolkien conceive of it as kind of like a children's book, and it was it for was, his it was children. Later. He wrote yeah. it in the nineteen thirties for his children, and they loved it. Uh, similarly, it's a story of good and evil, and just going with heroism. What is it? It's an average guy living a quiet life, and he's put into an adventure that totally takes him out of his comfort zone and it has all these battles with dwarves. And then yes, what you're referring to is the chapter of the riddles in the dark where Bilbo finds the ring, puts it in his pocket and meets the evil Gollum. 
who is this creature who's owned the ring. By the way, no, all spoilers, let's just say this. All spoilers. Yeah, well, yeah, for if sure. If you haven't read sure. the book, read read the book. But but this is an analysis, and it's not going to be like a scholarly, you know, detailed. There are Tolkien scholars. We're going to try oh, yeah. to get as much right as we can, but it's the principles that are more important right now for us. And yes, so Gollum agrees to have this contest, these riddles, because he wants to eat Bilbo. And, <laughs> and Bilbo's like, I'll tell you what, if if we do these riddles and, and I win, you have to show me out of the way. And if I lose, you can eat me. You know, how's that for a conflict? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's, that, that no, no pressure, no pressure there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if I lose, if I lose, you know, I'm dinner for this creature. Yeah, yeah no, no pressure on Bilbo at all. <laughs> so then, yeah, so Bilbo asks, what do I have in my pocket? And Gollum tries three guesses. He actually says four, doesn't, he doesn't get it right, and then goes berserk, and then chases Bilbo, who accidentally puts the ring on his finger and becomes invisible. And that's... Um, you know, that's one of the powers of the ring and he escapes and then holds the ring for many, many years and uses it periodically when he's in a pinch. And then if we, you know, now go to the Lord of the Rings as a novel, when he's in the opening, Tolkien gives this whole backstory about hobbits themselves and what they're like. They're very peaceful. They live, they live this tranquil life in the northern part of Middle Earth not concerned with anything that's happening with with the rest of the world. Uh, just very simple, uh, as we've talked about, Andy, they eat six meals a day. Uh, ah, they're, they're and, like Americans, they wanna, they wanna, you know? Yeah. They want to fill the corners. They call it, even when they're full, they want to go and, and fill the corners. Yeah, well, they'll, they'll have lunch, they'll clean up the mess <laughs> after lunch, and then they'll have second lunch, right? So, I mean, you got you got to love these guys. I mean, they're, they're real Americans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they they are actually i'll have something to say about the americanism that i find in the novel but one of the great appeals to me andy was also the, the poetry so let's just take a step back and the poem that relates to the ring it says one ring to rule them all one ring to find them one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them and as you said that is that is sauron the arch villain the the one who created the ring and uh, dominates the story because it's his obsession with um, maintaining the ring. And actually, we could even go farther back in time in, in the world of Middle Earth where the ring, it doesn't start with Bilbo finding it. it uh, Sauron has it and he's maintaining his power. And in a battle, the great battle, um, he, he, he has uh, one of the characters down. Well, I should know this, but it's an ancestor of Strider, Aragorn, and right. Um, right. steps on his sword, breaks the sword, and he just has half of the sword, and he chops off the, the ring finger of Sauron, and, and the ring becomes uh, free, and then he takes it and uh, has it for some time, and then is killed by the orcs, and then it goes uh, into the water, which is where Gollum uh, actually, Gollum's brother, uh, Smeagol and Deagle. Deagle finds it, Gollum kills him to maintain it. And that's the whole idea of the power of the ring. It makes people do what they, th they don't want to do. But th here is the free will aspect, Andy, because it doesn't really make them do. Everybody has a choice every step of the way in this novel. And I think Tolkien, he straddles that fence of you know free will versus uh this this uh what we can call like metaphysical power that this ring uh might have you want you want to speak to that uh, a little bit yeah there's a couple of, there's a couple of points i, I wanted to make mm -hmm. in the hobbit these these uh evil creatures were called goblins as i recall and then later on in the in the trilogy they become orcs which is you know i think they're the same creatures but a different name so i assume yeah. You know, goblins is a term that's been around for a long time. And uh, Tolkien, who was a master of different languages and, you know, creating yes. languages and stuff, I assume this is a term that he, that he coined, orcs, for these, you know, for, yes. for, for these e evil creatures. And it's better. It's, it's more, it's it's punchier. It's, it's, it's scarier than the term goblins, you know. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so I like it. Uh, yeah. Another point regarding the backstory I wanted to make, and here I'm, here I'm speculating. 
But uh, a lot of a lot of the the viewers of the Hero Show, I'm, I'm guessing, are familiar with Plato. They've read the Republic. You know, they they know the story of the you know of of the Ring of Gyges. You know, and uh, in in the in those early books of 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 the Republic, you know, one of the characters, I think it's Glaucon. I, I can't remember for sure which one, but he's backing up yes. Thrasymachus's claim. Mm. Thrasymachus, the sophist, claiming that you know all people deep down inside, you know, are filled with these evil desires, and the only thing that prevents us from acting them out is fear of getting caught. And if we had the power to escape retribution, we would act out our real desires. And I think it's Glaucon tells the story about the Ring of Gyges, who was a shepherd, and he was an adult. So, you know, he had a track record of being this honest, upright guy. And he finds this ring, and when he puts it on, you know, it, it makes him invisible. And he, he figures with invisibility, he can now, you know, he can now act out all of his innermost secret, you know, violent, criminal, illicit desires. And he, you know, and he, and he does. And, you know, the, the, there's the theme of the story that if, that that's every man and every woman that if we, if we, if we were sure we could get away with deep down inside, we're filled with all these illicit desires, maybe even criminally violent desires. And if we were certain, you know, we could escape identification and, you know, that we could act them out with impunity that we would, that if we had the power to do so, we would. And so I'm guessing here that, you know, Tolkien, who was a great scholar and everything, you know, was familiar with that story in, in Plato and the Ring of Invisibility probably comes from those early books of, you know, the idea for the Ring of Invisibility probably comes from those, those early books of the Republic. And you're right, Robert, the Ring has tremendous power, you know, it, it, even the, the and, and it's, and literarily, I think Tolkien had to create this race of, of being, I don't want to call the hobbits creatures, but this race of beings who are pure good, who are just, because only they could withstand the power of the ring, you know, long enough to, to uh, you know, to destroy it. And, um, you know, that human beings, I think Tolkien, Tolkien was a devout Catholic, wasn't he? And I think, yes. um, and, you know, and, and the Catholic view of human nature, of course, is that we're sinful. Which is a you know a religious version of the of the secular vision put forth by Thrasymachus and Glaucon in you know in, in the Republic that deep down inside this is who we are we're filled with all these you know the, the, these sinful urges uh, so so human I think Gandalf even says it at some point in the story right that human beings couldn't withstand the power of the ring and even the hobbits can't indefinitely Man, but they're, he, they're, he, right they're yeah, they're, yeah right, right Andy let me yeah. if I could just interject they're called the race yeah, of ahead. men. No, that's all. That that's the reference. Yeah. The human reference is the the age of men is they failed, and it's Elendil is the uh, you know the ancestor uh, of Strider, and yeah, that was where the sword was broken. And if we do, if we go with allegories, we could probably even say that is original sin. If you you know the ring is like original sin, you're tempted, you're really tempted, but you should resist. Uh, that temptation and Bilbo as a hobbit lived a peaceful life and he gained a, a certain degree of wealth and comfort but he wasn't after power as such so therefore the ring had much less significant than his pr predecessor Gollum who used it and 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 it destroyed him and turned him into this sniveling shriveling you know skinny being uh, and just just one update, Andy, on the clarif Fil clarifying filled the with goblins. evil, filled with evil, evil yes. desires, including and the perpetrate murder. Yes, yes, and and afraid of the sun, you know, the golden face right. that, that he calls it, and just all things evil. He, his the, his best day is just grabbing a fish <laughs> and eating it raw. Like that's all that's all you got <laughs> in life. <laughs> you right. know, isn't there more to it? Right. And Bilbo is this tranquil guy who wants to write the story there and back again. You know, he went to there and came right. back again. That's the uh, subtitle of the Hobbit. And right, he even though he has the ring for some time, he's not really tempted, uh, you know, essentially tempted the way others, the way men are, the way other races right. within the world of, of right. That's yeah. That's uh, why Tolkien yeah, had to create this Rings. race. Yeah, this create this race different from men who are morally pure. Uh, they're, they're, yes. they're, they're spiritually, they're, they're filled with goodness. And even they can't withstand the evil, the seductive powers of the ring indefinitely. Because Bilbo, hobbits live a long time, which you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, when we get to Saruman and, the, you know, in the, the, sec, the second book of the, 
Two Towers, but mm-hmm. they lived into their hundreds. Bill Bulls, I don't have to get how old he is. He's like 110 or 120, you know, and the ring started to work His 11th it. birthday. I'm, I'm sorry. And, birthday, his, yeah. It starts his 11th birthday, and, Bro, and Frodo is 33. So September 22nd, they celebrate, and he says it's one gross. <laughs> and everyone is like, oh, what a word. <laughs> gross. <laughs> but go ahead. Right. So yeah, he's 100, 111, you know, and it started, the, the ring is starting to work on him. But Gandalf was a Gandalf wants to destroy it, and then he gets my precious, right? You know, and he, 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 he turns for, for a second, even this benign. Hobbit turns into this angry, you know, ferocious creature. You can't have, you know, my ring, but it's my precious. And I, doesn't Gandalf say to him, my precious? Yes, it's been referred to, you know, you know by, by that name. But you see the ring starting to starting to work on him. And even Frodo later on, which we'll get to, you know, is uh, is reluctant to, you know, to, to give it to give it up. So the mm-hmm. so the, you, you're right. Philosophically, there's this there's this issue here of free will determinism. Because it's like you you can make moral choices, the hobbits anyway, can make moral choices for so long. And then a ring has this overpowering, you know, has this, this overpowering impact on on even, even the purest beings in this universe of Middle Earth. So there's a determinist mm-hmm. element. And I think, again, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence. Tolkien's a devout Catholic. You know, evil has this kind of power in, in, for sinful, sinful human beings. Tempts us, yeah. Temp, you know. Yes. Adam and Eve, you know, succumbed. A lot of human beings suc- succumb, you know, to the to the temptations to to perpetrate sinful actions. And you can see, you can see mm-hmm. Tolkien's religiosity in in the story. Although, you know, I'm not a fan of that, but it doesn't detract from the greatness of you know, of, of of Tolkien's literary achievement, in, in my judgment. Yeah, and and also it is a tale of good versus evil, and in many ways, what he considers good you and I consider good, which is, yes. you know, the noble and the honest and uh, things that yeah. heroes do, which is overcoming adversity and, and yeah. the, all of the right. adversity is from the evil side. And the peace love, the non-violence, the non-aggressive, all the, the aggression comes from Sauron and his, his oh, from the bad guys, from Sauron and Saruman yes. who, becomes, who becomes an acolyte of uh, of, mm-hmm. of sour and all the aggression comes from the from the bad guys, the good guys, mm-hmm. as heroes do, fight in self defense. You know, and, and, yeah. and, and, and so at Bilbo's of, party, his eleventieth part. Yeah, I'm sorry, Andy. So I was gonna, yeah. just going to yeah, say, at Bilbo's party, his eleventieth party, he prepares to say goodbye. He throws this long, you know, this gigantic thing with fireworks, and uh, and one of the things he's famous for is giving speeches he loves being he loves writing poetry and giving speeches and here's one of the lines that got to me like right you know right from the get get go he says i don't know half of you half as well as i should like and i like less than half of you half as well as you deserve <laughs> now is that a compliment that's deep yeah what does that mean <laughs> And everyone's silent because they're wondering. It says my 11th birthday and Frodo, his nephew, he's handing over, um, you know, the reins in effect to him. And they says that equals one gross. And everyone's like, oh, boy. And, and then all of a sudden at the party, he says goodbye, slips on the ring, vanishes. And then happily, that's the last time they ever see him in uh, the Shire. We didn't even mention the Shire is a place where the hobbits live. This uh, beautiful, be- you know, beautiful place, as I say. Uh, actually, Andy, if I could backtrack a little bit, the genius of Tolkien. He started with maps. He wrote maps of the the Middle Earth as a way. If we think conceptually, how does a creative, how how does a novelist come up with, create literally create a universe, you know, his own universe? Mm-hmm. And he started with maps with different terrains and you know mountains and rivers, and they're all essential to the plot. And then in the map map of the northeast northwest of the Shire is where the the, the hobbits are. So they're again they're they're geographically distant from all the happenings in the in the rest of um the, uh, the rest of middle earth and but they're protected by men and they don't even recognize how well they're protected by men so then yeah, the, as rangers, you said, after, the rangers right the, yes, the rangers, the rangers are yes. protecting the show yeah that you yeah. know and they'll and, and they'll and they'll yeah go ahead 
I was just going to finish up. So then he goes right to that scene with Gandalf, as as you had mentioned. He goes back to his home for the last time. He wants to keep the ring, but Gandalf says, no, just leave it there for Bilbo. He, want, he even asks Gandalf if he wants the ring. And even Gandalf hesitates for a moment. Now, Gandalf doesn't want it. He knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, do, he, he doesn't know, want yeah. He doesn't want what it would turn him into. And then right. Bilbo has, I, I just want to, uh, one of my favorite poems in, in the book, when he leaves, it's, uh, he says, the road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Now far ahead, the road is gone and I must follow if I can. Pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet and whither then I cannot say. So mm -hmm. that's Bilbo's life. You know, he's on the road and he's going off to leave the Shire forever as far as the story goes. And he, he goes to a place we know called Rivendell, but now it transitions to Frodo and who's right. completely innocent. He's he's a Baggins, but he's not, you know, he, he's not like Bilbo in many ways. And um, Gandalf tells him, now you have it, keep it safe, keep it secret. Don't use the ring. And that's what Frodo does for the next uh, 17 years in, in the story of the novel. Now, Gandalf, in the meantime, actually, a, a couple of points. You're right. The Shire is this agricultural sector. There's no industrialization, and yet they have a copious uh, amount of food. Uh, uh, but it's <laughs> fantasy. And you know, we'll, 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 yes. we'll recur to the industrialization issue. Uh, but you know, they have a copious amount of food, and they live very peacefully, like you said, in this in this agricultural sector, protected by the rangers, who who are human beings, you know, good men, uh, you know, and they and they protect the the innocence of, of the hobbits. Aragorn, Aragorn, of course, is one of the uh, known as Strider, is is one of the, one of the yes. rangers. But um, Gandalf suspects, doesn't he, early in the in the uh, trilogy? That Sauron is active again, and he wants to. He yes. wants to corroborate. He wants to corroborate that, because if he can corroborate it, he knows that the ring to keep the ring. There's only one thing to do with the ring to keep it from Sauron, and that is it. It, it must be destroyed. And so Gandalf is yes. off on an expedition for those years, isn't he? Investigating. Yes. He comes back Investigating with, with the bad news. Comes back with yes. the bad news that yes. Sauron he, is is active again. He's back. That's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know the whole time that Bilbo has it and the first 17 years that Frodo has it. Gandalf does not know it is the one ring. So once he finds that news, he knows that um, Bilbo has to get it out of the Shire because they capture Gollum. Sauron captures Gollum and he's being tortured. And he just says, do, do, where's the ring? He says two words, Baggins and Shire. And that's enough for Sauron's uh, henchmen to go to the Shire. And uh, Frodo has very little time to do so. And he fears he has to do this alone. And his gardener, let's now move on to, you mentioned Strider, well, we, my we, number one. Yeah, well, first five, we should yeah, say one, ahead, what, what, one, thing, one thing first, though, we should, we should say Gandalf is a wizard, right? And, yes. uh, you know, he has, he has certain, Gandalf the Grey. And uh, you know he he has definite magical powers. He's a he's a formidable dude, and he's and he's definitely <laughs> definitely a good guy. Uh, I mean we, I mean we we see how powerful he is when he takes on the the Balrog later you know later on. Uh, <laughs> you know this is really menacing dragon kind of creature. But yeah, no, he's got powers, and you know he's he's distinctively a, a heroic uh, character. He's a good guy. And he knows he doesn't want the ring. He knows the power it has to turn, you know, turn men towards evil. And with his power, that would be a that would be a disaster for for the for the good. And 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 so yeah, this is this is Gandalf, of course, and he's a central figure in the story and and a, and a yes. towering hero in 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 the story. He and he and Aragorn are just towering heroes. Yes, and I could say I've read the book. Andy, I'll tell you at least like fifty times since back in 50? high school. You read fifty? Five zero? At, at least I uh, five zero. Wow. I listened to the audiobooks. I wow. you know, Carrie Ann and I just read the whole thing, the whole saga, 
to each other. We read to each other at you know at the end of uh, the night, and we just finished the saga, which is one reason I wanted to cover it. By the way, yeah, the going end, to date, at the end of the we, night, what are you guys doing at the beginning of the night? Sounds like it sounds <laughs> it sounds very romantic. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Actually, earlier we read all of Les Mis. We were on this project to read Les Mis, so we've had two epics uh, the, this yeah, really? entire wow, yeah. year of of reading, but. Uh, yeah, see so if you I can get through. Novel, see if you can get through War and Peace, Robert. I've I've tried no. War and Peace three different times in my life. I've never been able to get past page hundred. As, as so Cyrano boring. says, no thank you, no thank you. And again, I say no thank you. 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 You're right. You've 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 tried you've tried reading War and Peace also. I assume, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, but at least the first five times, Strider Aragorn was like up here in the stratosphere, and then little by little. I actually have a more a, a more favorite hero, and he comes in this scene. That is Samwise, um, uh, Samwise, Sam Gamgee, who's Frodo's gardener, and he hears this news that Gandalf is telling Frodo about the ring, and he, basically he tells Frodo, "No, you're not going alone. Sam will go with you." And Sam loves the elves. He loves tales of heroism. Never again, unsuspecting guy doesn't think he's ever going to be faced with all of this, this good versus evil. But to me, his character is, you know, we see the arc of his character just going from a simple gardener who loves Frodo and wants to protect him, which is exactly what is needed for this quest. And the first stage of the quest is to take the ring from the Shire to Rivendell, which is not very far geographically, uh, but Rivendell is where the elves uh, live. Um, and and the, the elves are always good guys with a great deal of power, right? Yes, and, and effectively immortal. They can only die, right. if I get the legend right, they can only die like in battle, but uh, they have just incredible strength. Uh, they have goodwill they they are good you know they are good beings they represent uh, you know they're not like santa's elves at all these guys are great with bow and arrows and and uh and yeah as we so see with, 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 Leg with lego legolas you know, legolas, legolas is yeah, an elf, yeah. right so this they decide sam will join frodo on this quest and then two other hobbits uh P Pippin and Mary, who are from a different that's not, part that's of not the Scotty, Shire. That's not Scotty Pippin going with, with MJ, right? It's a different different member no. of the Pippin family. <laughs> yes, that's right. Different, different uh, Peregrine Took is actually the full name, and Marriott Brandybuck are the two uh, the two. You can't beat Tolkien for names. You can't, right? You with can't names, beat Tolkin no. for names. That's You're right, right. So they're on this way to Rivendell, and then they, there's a town on the way called Bree, uh, which has hobbits, it has men, and it has CD, CD uh, characters. And that's where they first meet Strider, who is watching them uh, from afar. And he has this grim look about him. And supposedly Gandalf is supposed to be waiting uh, taking them on the journey, but in heroic stories, sometimes things happen that uh, the the underdogs have to take these actions by, you know, by themselves without yeah, the guidance something, that they something expected. Kept Gandalf, so, some, something kept Gandalf detained. I can't remember what it was, but he was, he was out fighting. Oh, I could tell you. Yeah, go no, ahead. no, no. He was in, he, a greater wizard who is Saruman captured Saruman. Gandalf and held him in the Tower of Orthanc. Uh, because Saruman knows that Gandalf knows something about the ring, and Gandalf saw, go, went to Saruman seeking counsel. How how do we battle Sauron? And Saruman's like, "I have you here. You're not getting out." So he was detained. But instead, right? Because Gandalf Gandalf didn't know that Saruman had been captured, his, his spiritually captured by Sauron, right? And was now that's a, right. was now an acolyte. He of, has the of, Palantir. Of he has this object called right. called the Palantir. It's like a seeing stone. You could see other places far away through Middle Earth. And Sauron is already hypnotizing Saruman, promising him all these riches. But as Gandalf says, there's only one ring and it can only be on one finger at a time. So even though Sauron's promising you this, he's not gonna give you what you want. You're gonna, he's gonna bend you to his will like he did with everyone else. So right. Gandalf exactly. is out of the picture temporarily but right. they meet that's, up that's, with that's what yeah yeah with they meet up with strider 
which turns out which to be Arab Orthodox. And they are already, I'm sorry, Andy, they are already pursued right. by these black riders, okay, who are the, the Najgul, <laughs> right? The Najgul. Ring, that's right. They become Nazgul. First, they're ring raids, so they're on horses. Uh, they're, they're men of the distant uh, past who were tempted, uh, who had rings, and they sold, effectively sold their souls. And now they're looking for the ring to give to Sauron, and they're and so they're the ones that are are pursuing Frodo and uh, and the ring. And there's and the Black Riders are, there. They are they're baleful. I mean, these are some these they're are some dangerous. <laughs> yeah, some dead. These are some dangerous hombres. They are some they are some bad dudes. And these are not these are not these are not guys you want on your back trail. You know when you're when you're trying to. Get to, to get to more more door to destroy the ring. More door, but yeah. you know who's <laughs> yeah. You know who's one of the most interesting characters to me in the story they meet in that first book is Tom Bombadil. You know who's uh, yes. who, who's who's got so much as old power as the hills. With, with it. Yeah, yeah. Who's who's who rules his domain very very benignly. He's he's a good guy, but he's got tremendous power within his within his province, and um, he and he protects. He protects them, as I recall, doesn't he? Tom Bombadil. He saves them from, yes, he saves yeah. them. I'm sorry, we can't go through like every detail. And Tom Bombadil, he is ultimate benevolence, Andy. He sings yeah, he and is. he dances yes. every day. He has a beautiful wife, Goldberry. And he is like, he's not even tempted by the ring. He asked Frodo, show me the ring. And he looks at it and he's like, wow, he tosses it up in the air. Frodo thinks he might be like a, you know, one of, one of those uh, magicians that, you know, now suddenly switch the rings, but Frodo tests him by putting the ring on. And Tom Bombadil's like, get take that thing off. You know, we're we're I know you have it. Come on. So you're right. It, is, it's Tom, like, is Tom Bombadil so is is he is he a human being? I forget. Is he a human being or is he some other kind of creature? No, I don't know the creature, but he's older than the hills. He was there when the he's older than all of nature in in effect. So um yeah he that's bounces, that's doesn't kind he? of what doesn't he when, when, the way he ambulates, does it? Doesn't he bounce? You know, he like, bounces. He dances. He's like a kangaroo. He's, he's a kangaroo, he's, <laughs> right. and sings, <laughs> and and yeah, just a, a well-known, you know, Tolkien fanatics, as as I am one to a high degree. They they just love Bombadil. His benevolence. He's like ultimate. Yeah, benevolence. yeah, absolutely. I, I love I, I love him. I'm not a Tolkien yeah, fanatic. Yeah, but I love I, I love Tom Bombadil. At some point in the story, uh, it's been a, it's been a few years since I've read. You know the 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 trilogy. Yep. But doesn't doesn't somebody ask Gandalf? Well, what about if we leave the ring with with Tom Bombadil? I, I, you know, yes. he, he's he's such tremendous power within his domain. He's he's enormously benevolent. Wouldn't it wouldn't it be safe there? And what is Gandalf says no, but I can't remember what his reasons are. What, 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 is, what does Tom no, Bombadil he, not he, want he, it? Very good. Yeah, very good. Well, he's he's benevolent and he because he does he's unconcerned with the affairs outside of his domain he would neglect it and then basically the bad guys would come in and get it that's that's effectively oh, the so reason is that, is that what get is that, that what Bob, Gandalf said? okay yeah, yes okay. yes yeah. and that's we'll go forward to the council of Enron, elrond they make it to rivendell and then elrond is the master elf uh, who heals frodo who gets wounded by the black riders and so they're in Rivendell. Now they decide what has to happen. And the, the council has men. It has dwarves. It has elves. All these different races uh, who who represent different kinds of you know different kinds of hum humans in in society. And they're all fighting over what to do. And Frodo says, "Well, I I tear up. I tear up when he says it. I will take the ring to Mordor, though I know not the way." And so effectively, he's saying, my life is now will never be the same because I had this ultimate quest effectively to save the universe of, of Middle Earth and whatever it takes, you know, it might very likely probably will lead to my death, but that's what I am choosing to do. Truly a heroic action that, you know, that Frodo yes. realizes the stakes yes. here. That there's good versus evil stakes, and you know, uh, some of this was written in the 1930s, right? Hit, Hitler is Hitler is consolidating power in in Germany. Stalin is in yes. power in Russia. You know, Mussolini's yeah. in power in Italy. 
Imperial Japan, mm -hmm. a very, very dangerous military, aggressive, expanded empires invading China. Uh, you know, it's like in in the story that when the the shadow falls over over Minas Tirith, the 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 capital, you know, the capital city of uh, Gondor, you know, where the Gondor. Where, where the good guys, yeah, Gondor, where the good guys live. Uh, I don't know if Tolkien was influenced by what was going on in in real life. I, I I've read somewhere that he that he said he was not that this is not a metaphor for fighting, you know, total you know national socialism or totalitarianism. But that's well, exactly might have right. been it might have been in his subconscious though, you know. That, Had to uh, be. That's my yeah, my answer. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. My data reach, uh, reflects yours, Andy. I heard that he denied it, and that he had. But he had to be. He was in. He fought in World War One. We're not going too much oh, into yeah, details yeah. of of the novel. But in World War One, there are scenes um, that are directly from what he experienced on the battlefield. And so, yes, he did. He did a lot of the data. I think f from his experience in the hardships of life in World War One and then continuing in World War II, uh, just to go to dates, July 29th, so originally we had hoped to do the show last week, it was the anniversary of the publication. July 29th, 1954 is when Lord of the Rings uh, was first published, but he wrote it over a few decades and right. it was, a you know, he, he wanted it to be one, you know, one volume, The Lord of the Rings. But they decided, the publishers decided to do it in three parts, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King over three different years. So they they knew this would be a, a cash cow. They knew they, there was a built-in audience for this because guess what? People want to read about heroes, right? You and I, that's, yeah, it's like not the only a ones. lot of people. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We're yeah. not the only ones. And, and so uh, just you know backtracking a little bit on on the heroism here so within in rivendell the council of elrond they decide okay this is what we're going to do and they want nine um nine members of the fellowship which is gandalf strider frodo bilbo uh, gimli the dwarf legolas the elf and boromir a man and there's backstory and conflict you know this is the between the the history between the dwarves and the elves they're they're antagonists over their history and one of the beautiful things about the novel is you see how they bond into friendship uh if i could just sidetrack i've never read a novel that has friendships dramatized on such on, on such a level from the lighthearted banter between like the hobbits all the way up to the profound, you know, uh, descriptions and actions between between the characters, friendship uh, in the in the Aristotelian sense of it takes a while. You know, you judge by character, and they're rare to find. And that's what the that's what these uh, characters. I, I think Tolkien is a master at uh, portraying friendship uh, in the novels. Now, I, yeah, I think I think you're you're absolutely right. And you know what's interesting about this, Robert, is the characterization of the dwarves, because the dwarves lost for gold, you know, <laughs> they're, they're digging in, they're in the mountains, you know, and they're, and they're digging arouses, all these, what does Gandalf say to them when the, when the Balrog shows up, there's, there's worse things in these depths than orcs, you know, and they're, they're digging for gold, and it would be easy for Tolkien, who's this religious guy, you know, to portray them as bad guys because you know it's the, the this is greed. This is you know this is this is a mm -hmm. sin, right? The the lust for gold, but he doesn't. You know the 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 dwarves are, are the dwarves are flinty. You know, tough kind of customers who lust for gold, but they're not evil. You know, they're not the orcs, no. and they're not no. they're not gonna capitulate to Sauron. They're gonna you know they're gonna fight for the you know you know for their liberty and their 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 capacity to go dig up some more gold somewhere you know and they, you know <laughs> he does and he does not portray them as bad guys and you're and you're right there was this conflict between the elves and the dwarves but legolas and, and gimli they they bond they become like brothers it's you're right it's, it's a very it's a very beautiful part of of the trilogy it's very touching and you know they, yeah you know, and they, on they that going other. yeah go ahead. yes yes and i would say also there's an aspect i think that is underrated uh, in the novels, which is love. So precisely when they make it, the, when the fellowship makes it their first journey uh, through different trials and tribulations where actually Gandalf falls in 
uh, Moria from the Balrog, as, as you described, and now they're leaderless. But Strider says he'll take them, and they go to the Elvis land of Lothlorien, where the Lady Galadriel is there. And um, Celeborn, her husband, sees that there's a dwarf in the land of the elves and is critical of him. But the lady says, you know, she makes Gimli feel at home. Says if anyone who's come here, despite the past background, uh, they are welcome here. Gimli literally falls in love with her. He's absolutely right. distraught. He's ready to take his ax to anyone who doesn't say she's the most beautiful creature in Middle Earth. <laughs> <laughs> he's just flabbergasted with her. And then after a couple of weeks in Lothlorien, they decide what to do, uh, where the next step is. And she, Galadriel gives gifts to each of the, each of the um, fellowship, and, except for Gimli. And she asks, what would a dwarf uh, want as a gift? And he says, Gold. I, I don't gold want would it. be a good start, Galadriel. <laughs> gold would be a good start. <laughs> and he gets gold. What is it? He asks for one strand of her hair, okay? And she gives him three. And she said, what would you do with it? He says, I'll put it, encase it as a treasure to be held up to, you know, to your honor. I mean, this guy is like, he is, this is love on a level that is really hard to, to, to I can't read it without breaking down. You know, he's, yeah, he's know, so moved uh, by this description. So they go through, you know, um, they continue. She gives, Frodo, down the she gives Frodo something, something special, doesn't it? Yes. That, that turns up later. Yeah, she gives oh, him the, the file. It's, it's a light, it's a, it's a light of, in of the goodness. Dark. Yes. Yeah. She and gives, that, that's and right, that, and, she and, gives, that, and that could would scare off all these evil beings that he might encounter yes. in the in the darkness. Yes. It's got the power, the you know, the metaphor. The light is goodness, and the dark is evil, and and the, the light right. of the elves, the, the light of, of yeah, the, the light of Galadriel's. Uh, uh, what is what? What is it? It's a file or, or something. She, she yeah, it's a file. Some, that's right. Yeah, the, and the light that shines forth. The yes. light that shines yes. forth scares away scares mm -hmm. away evil 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 creatures, which probably saves mm -hmm. Frodo's life a little bit later on in the story. It uh, absolutely does. So just oh, Shelob, Shelob, right? Was that the name of the spider monster? Was not the name Shelob? Shelob, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think. Yeah, uh -huh. Shelob, yeah, oh, the you girl know, the names. the names. Yeah, the names are great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the another conflict the first conflict within the fellowship is Boromir who is a man from Gondor he is the steward his father Denethor is the steward of Gondor so there's no king they no don't king know yet. that Aragorn right. is the future king so there's a conflict Andy that American Aragorn Aragorn's, don't, Aragorn's don't the it. descendant wait Aragorn's the descendant of the rightful kings of Gondor isn't that right yes that's a, that's exact. But Boromir doesn't know that, so he looks. And yeah, nobody, him, nobody knows, uh, including the reader. Nope. We just, we just know, we just know Strider's a ranger and he's a hard rock. <laughs> he's a tough guy. We don't know that he's the rightful king of Gondor. It's, it's, yeah, it's something exactly, that comes up later exactly. in the story. Yeah, yeah. But Boromir wants the ring, so he cap he he corners Frodo because they're at a point where they don't decide what the, they can't decide what the next step is, and Boromir, little by little, he lusts for the ring, and tries to take it by force from Frodo. Frodo puts on the ring, vanishes. They go back to where the fellowship is. Then orcs come and all hell breaks loose. Um, and Frodo and Sam go to the boats. And one of Frodo's main conflicts is he doesn't want his friends to die. He knows he has to do it. He's somewhat willing to die, assumes he's going to die in the quest, but he doesn't want his friends to die. But Sam says, no, I'm. Go we're going together to Mordor. And the two other hobbits get captured, Pippin and Merry, Aragorn, Strider, um, Gimli, and Legolas search for the hobbits, and Boromir is killed by a thousand, um, a thousand arrows. So that's you know that's the breaking me, of the you, fellowship, me, and that's right. Yeah, right, that's the that's the end of Volume One, right? As I recall, yes, that's the end let, of let Volume me, One. Let, yep. Right. Let me let me ask you a question because uh, as I recall. Boromir, for all of his flaws and you know lust for the ring and the power that that'll bring, doesn't he die heroically holding off the orcs to save to save the hobbits? And he he, he kills I don't know how many of the orcs before they before they kill him. So he dies yes. a, he dies a hero's death, doesn't he? 
he di- and, he uh, dies a hero's death. They bury him accordingly. They have the horn that he, that um, he and they put him in a, in a small like canoe, and he floats down the river Anduin. And eventually, his father and his brother recognize that that is that is him. So he absolutely dies a heroic death. Basically, he had yeah. one little weakness at a bad time, you know, in his life. If we look historically, you know, maybe like Magellan yeah, I, you know, suffered the same fate. Right. Right, you know, and we'll do a hero show episode on Magellan without a doubt. Yes, but yeah, we will. But Gandalf, yes. But yeah, but Gan- Gandalf said, you know, the, the men can't withstand the 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 irresistible, you know, seductive lore of the ring. And Boromir is a man; he falls yeah. under under it under its spell, yes. and then he he, he, he yes. shakes it off. You know, at the end to to protect the retreating hobbits and fight off. I don't, you know, like you said, I know, mm-hmm. dozens, maybe hundreds of orcs. Uh, in the, yeah. in the in in the, in the Peter Jackson movie movies, which I which I personally like a lot, and I if you haven't seen them out there, I would certainly recommend them. But mm-hmm. not in lieu of the books, you know, to to supplement or complement the books, you got to read the books if you have never read Tolkien. Because if you don't read the books, you your life's not complete if you don't read the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yes, but, I agree. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> but I remember in the movie version, and you know, at the end of their uh, Strider. There was this one particularly monstrous orc, you know, and 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 I, I remember Strider uh, takes his sword, this broadsword, plunges it through his heart. You know, so the, the creature at that point is dead. Then he withdraws the sword and two handed swings it, you know, like like Babe Ruth, like, you know, we did Hero Show, and chops off this creature's head. So in effect, he killed the thing twice. You know, he, he yeah. plunged the sword through his heart and then chopped off his head. That's not good. He's not dead enough, you know. I just ripped out his heart. You know, now I got to chop off his head too. So yeah, oh yeah, he's dead. He's dead, Aragorn. D D D D. He's dead. You know, yes. it's a great scene, yes. great scene <laughs> yes. at, the, at the at the end of of, uh, of uh, you know the first volume, the, the yes. fellowship of the, the fighting Urukai they are called, and they actually are for Saruman. They are not for Sauron. <laughs> they're for they're for Saruman. Right, for Saruman right. Saruman created this race of super orcs, right? Yes. You know, and right. and we we right. and yeah, and we and we come to we come to this in the in the two towers. I always. Tempted to think of it as the Twin Towers, but that's a whole nother, Me whole too. nother story. Me too. Yeah. My whole life. The, the, You're right, Andy. Yeah. Me too. Mm-hmm. And the, so in the, two towers, two towers let's yeah. do this real real fast. It's divided well, into let's, two well, let's, parts. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, Robert. Let's, let's do the two towers, and then let's we'll do another show on Tolkien next week okay. for the, the yeah. for Armageddon, the climactic <laughs> battle in, 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 in Return of the King. And we could discuss Tolkien's life and and you know his yes. relationship, you know, with his with his Perfect. wife, uh, you know, his wife, and of course and more the analysis of the film too. More more analysis yeah. of the film it's- because I had I yeah they they were they you know they were an incredible experience for me. I have all three on DVD, and uh, yeah, hi- highly highly recommend. Yeah, discuss the, the Peter well. Jackson movies. Discuss the Tolkien biopic <laughs> from a couple of years ago. Yes. Which, which and there's was, one other good. thing. This is a BBC, a 13 part series, audio only. This is my favorite. I, this I actually liked more than the films because it's 95% Tolkien's words acted out. Uh, and Ian Holm, who is Bilbo in the film, in, in the audio here, he plays Frodo. So Ian Holm likes, definitely likes Lord of the Rings. But yeah, so going to the Two Towers, the first part of the Two Towers is only the, the uh, search for the hobbits. Now we're introduced to Rohan, the writers of Rohan, another Rohirrim, kingdom of men. Right? Yeah. Hmm? yeah, the Rohirrim. Yeah. The, they're known as great horsemen and they have their they're cavalry. They're, they're real power. They're, they're powerful cavalry. Right. They're powerful cal- yeah. cavalry, but uh, Theoden, who is the king, he's withering away because Grimir Wormtongue, who is a henchman of Saruman, Wormtongue. is telling Wormtongue. him, don't do this, yeah. don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> Wormtongue, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? I know, what you... I know, it's, it's, a great it's amazing, yeah, it's absolutely yeah. amazing. And Yeah, Wormtongue his... is in the king's ear, right? He's Whisper, don't resist, yeah. Ear. Yeah, don't resist. And, he, and he's withering. He's withering away. Aomer, who is, it's uh, um, not his son directly. His son, uh, uh, Theoden's son, gets killed in battle. But Aomer is the one who's banished 
basically because he's under because Theoden is under the um, thumb of of Wormtongue. He sees Strider, um, Legolas, and Gimli out in the wilderness. Uh, he comes with his horsemen, and again, a pivotal scene in the in the in the uh, book is he calls them Riders of Rohan. Where are you going? And basically, they just kill the orcs and um frodo i'm sorry aragorn legolas and gimli think they also killed the two hobbits who were captured but he says no we, we you know we don't know we just we killed them all and all of the other men around him they're seeing these three different creatures and they're ready to just you know kill them or capture them but aragorn stands up and he says you know i am the direct descendant of elendil and uh, everyone just, it's the first time anyone sees him on his way to becoming a king uh, in, in the novel. They give him horses, they end up finding uh, the hobbits, and um, the hobbits, though, they play a pivotal role. So one of the things in, in Rivendell, when they even allow the two, Merry and Pippin, to join, they say maybe this is the era of the hobbits, and Gandalf has a beautiful... Uh, a beautiful description because the hobbits escape and go into the um, the, the the forest where Treebeard is there, and um, they rile up the trees who are being attacked and chopped down by Saruman. And Gandalf says, maybe this like the like the few pebbles that start an avalanche. That might be what the hobbits are. These little people. Now is their turn. You know, the right. men have protected them right. for so long, and now it might be their turn to um, to take the the next steps. And and that's let me let me ask you. That's let, what, what let me ask you yep. something because uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, Worm tongue is he under the spell of Sauron or Saruman? Which who, who, he's he's an agent. Uh, for yes, Sar Saruman. Yeah, Saruman. Okay, uh, which is a good, of, of, It's a good point, Andy. Saruman. One of the critiques of Tolkien is that he's got two villains with almost the same name, Sauron. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> who is the red eye and the creator of the ring, and Saruman, who is a wizard of higher order than uh, Gandalf. But yes, he might, has might a point, but he should have might a point, but he should have given Saruman a different, you know, different name. You know, uh, I think so a, too. A letter, um, letter other than language, S, but it's. Right, uh, Tolkien was a linguist, so he had a he, he had a reason for these kinds of things, and I might I might not you know agree with him, but I'm I'm not going to fight with his success. Yeah, there. it's a minor, it's a and, minor point. It's such yeah. a, it's a, it's such a yeah. great story. Minor point at such a moment, Rhett says to Scarlet, right? And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely a detail here. So okay, I, I what one thing that stuck in my mind from from the movie, Robert. Is when Theoden, mm -hmm. who, like you said, is withering away under the spell yes. of Worm Tongue and, and his his boss Saruman, uh, and Theoden, you know, Theoden says, "I don't want war," you know, and 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 Aragorn says to him, "War is upon you," you know, that is yes. dramatic, yes. dramatic moment. You you're either going to let yes. yourself your country be conquered by the bad guys by this army of super orcs of Saruman, or you're going to stand up and fight for, for your liberty and. Uh, a yeah. very noble moment, you know. Aragorn pointed out, none of us want war, but uh, you know, there's no choice. The, when, it's come when, to, when Hitler's right, armies, it's, when it's Hitler's come armies are invading your country, yeah, yeah. What was that great line right. from Tolst from Tolstoy uh, that you may have no interest in evil, but evil has an interest in you, <laughs> you, you know? Yes. And yes. that is that is very that is very true, and that's what the Odin has to face now. And does does Aragorn kill uh, Worm Tongue? I don't remember. Does he kill him? Or I know he gets. I no. know he, he finishes his influence over over the Odin, the Odin King. Worm Tongue. As, hey, uh, Worm Tongue has a few really important scenes in the future, and and one major one is at the end of the Two Towers. So they let him go. Theoden lets him go. He crawls uh, back to the Tower of Orthanc, which is where Saruman um, has rules in. Um, and had captured Gandalf earlier. So that's where Wormtongue is. As the trees, or the Ents, I'm sorry, they're called Ents, they're not exactly trees, they go back and they take over. Isengard is the name of the land that uh, Saruman rules. And basically, it's just beautifully played, as, as, as you're referring to the, to the films, where these trees, they break the dams. And so the place is flooded, and the orcs well, we have, are all killed. No, we have, you, yeah, no, you're right. But we have to discuss the Entmut, 
right? <laughs> right? Doesn't that take doesn't that take place in the two towers? The end, the it end takes move? like, yeah. and it also takes like six hours because they speak so slowly. You know? Yeah, I mean they're trees. <laughs> they they live for centuries. They they're not, there's no hurry. There's no there's no hurry for them. You know, and the end, the end moot. What a great name. The end, the ends of the trees. The moot is this is this this policy this discussion session they have. And it takes going yeah. on forever. Yeah. What are we going to do? And then is it is it is it the the hobbits who are there urging them on? Come on, I, you know, some of the that's good it. guys are there. They're the pe- they yeah. are the pebbles of the avalanche. That that yeah. that's exactly what they are. They're these little pebbles, and they start the avalanche by riling up yeah. the ants to to. And yeah, the ant move takes forever. Take for, take forever. The the answer, you know, discussing what the policy is, issues here, and finally they say, like you said, Robert, you know, Saruman's proteges are chopping down the trees. We can't have that. They rise up, and they 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 here come the trees. You know, here come the trees after after Saruman. I remember the first time I read it, I was thinking, it reminded me of Macbeth. Remember the prophecy mm. is not until the, the yes. I don't remember the exact wording, yes. but the, not until the, the the trees of the forest come to come to your castle right. will you be in danger. And of course, of course, his enemy, Macbeth's enemies, disguise themselves, you know, you know, as, as vegetation and stuff, and f- fulfill the prophecy. But Good here point. come the trees. Good point. And yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't want the trees after you, man. You don't want the ants because they have they have big, powerful trees. You know, like like gigantic, towering oaks. And they come and they yes. and they just lay waste to, to Saruman's uh, domains, don't they? That's right, especially by breaking the dam. So Gandalf is now back on the scene. Uh, he he uh, comes out of after fighting the Balrog. We didn't really even touch, t- talk that much about that in Moria. Well, and the three, you know, Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas, they've been through battles, and they see him in the old forest and uh, realize that. They have to help now that they've found the hobbits. They have to go back to save Rohan, which is which Saruman is ready to uh, destroy with this weapon called a a bomb. Actually, it's the first time a bomb is ever and and they go through uh, Helm's Deep, which is a huge barrier. It explodes. Uh, Legolas and Gimli are having this contest of who can kill more orcs and they're counting I have 41 oh I, I have 42 and it's like this little friendly rivalry between these two uh, yeah Gimli know, the dwarf with his, with his axe and Legolas it's the elf right. with the bow with the bow and arrow with the yeah. bow yeah. True, yeah. True. yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. so they succeed uh, and then they all go to Isengard where uh, Saruman is up in the top of the tower and Wormtongue is with him and basically Saruman's trying to sucker in you know uh, Theoden to becoming his friend doesn't work and Wormtongue has the palantir the, the the thing that Saruman how he would communicate with Sauron and he tosses it into the the, the water and uh, Pippin takes the the palantir and is completely o- overcome with it actually looks into it and Sauron thinks that that is Frodo he thinks it's it's actually Frodo he knows that a hobbit has the ring so again it's pivotal in a uh, moment mm-hmm. there and uh this is you know after Saruman is pretty much gone that part of the two towers is finished then the whole so that's really book three book four is only Frodo and Sam uh, out in the wilderness trying to make it to Mordor they're completely lost Gollum but, but, finally but, but, comes but, into hold, hold on a second. Yeah, before, go ahead. Before, yeah, before we uh, get to back to the Hobbits, we should say something about Saruman and the industrialization that, that he initiates. Yes. Because he has a whole yes. factory system where he's churning out these super, these super orcs. And uh, again, you know, it, 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 we take Tolkien at his word. He's not thinking consciously of Nazi Germany. You know, and the war machine that they're building, but I have to guess. You know, this is subcon. You know, artists. What did Ayn Rand say in her, uh, her course on fiction writing? Artists right out of their sub basement, she called it. You know, you know, out of the their, their subconscious has to be. I would think it is subconscious that the you know Nazi Germany has taken this the, the tremendous industrial capacity of, of Germany and turned it to you know to weapons of war to a war machine. And Tolkien looks, looks like he's making a, uh, a very negative commentary on industrialization. 
that industrialization, you know, is, is at best dangerous. It, it can, can technology and industrialization can churn out all these weapons of war that could wreak havoc on uh, free countries and, and innocent persons. And it struck me when I was reading, and I've mentioned this several times, you know, in, in various lectures that I give on, on capitalism, that, you know, the hobbits have copious amounts of food in an agricultural society that has no technology or industrialization, no science, no, no agricultural science, no agricultural technology. Where they out, they out work in the North 40 with a hand plow and a mule. There's no harvesters, you know, tractors, combines. They don't have any tech. And that's just in fantasy, no problem. He's Tolkien's right in fantasy, fine. We grant him the premise. But I think in mm -hmm. the character of Saruman in the Two Towers, I think he's making a a, a serious, trying to make a serious criticism about industrialization. And if that's the case, he's just flat out mistaken. You can't have the kind of uh, agricultural harvests, you know, copious amounts of food without a scientific and technological and industrial revolution. It's just, it's never been done. It can't be done. You can't grow that much food with just muscle power of human beings and animals. You need uh, agricultural science and agricultural technology. So I just want to point that out here. Uh, I, uh, that if Tolkien's making this kind of negative commentary on industrialization, and I think he is, he's flat out wrong on this issue. Again, relatively minor point in the overall context because he's a hero worshiper par yes. excellence, and we love him for that. But I, but I thought we should just just point that out. Excellent point, Andy. I I totally agree. That's one of the reasons. So if I go back biographically. When I read the, the Rings, it was before my Ayn Rand discovery, which was completely as overwhelming in a different sense as it was in reading Tolkien. And for the first several years of being, you know, reading Rand's work and the rationality and this world focus, I put aside the fantasy world. You know, I, I just completely, and I saw those, those errors. I saw original sin, I saw anti-industrialism and it diminished my enjoyment of the novel. But then after about five or six years, I went back to it and I just said, yeah, I can pick and choose exactly what appeals to me. And those things are, uh, they're, they're not appealing to me, but they don't detract necessarily from the good versus evil aspect because aside from the industrialism Saruman is he's got all the flaws you know he's not just as brilliant industrial he's got slaves doing this stuff you know he's he yeah, wants right. power himself it's just that he you know I actually think you make a really good point if, if, if we're looking at Germany ramping up their industrialization and that might be that's kind of like a bad use of, of industrialism when it's for the sake of power as opposed to the American history where it is simply for the uh, in sake of improving human life. Yeah, consumer goods rather than weapons of war. Yes, you know. Yes, so, I mean there, there's, yeah. there's power. There's power to do good and there's power to do evil. And you know the power of science, technology, and industrialization can do, can do and has done in free countries an enormous amount of good. And, you know, good in creating wealth and creating consumer goods. Uh, you know, and and, and mm -hmm. raising living living standards dramatically and in the hands of totalitarian states like Nazi Germany or the, the Soviet Union or the communist uh, regime in China today can do an enormous amount of harm. You, the, the, you know, you build that, build on a war economy, they're churning out, you know, huge amounts of weapons of war to be used aggressively against, you know, uh, yeah. peaceful neighbors. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. but Tolkien, but, to, but Tolkien, you know, so he's mistaken on, on he's, if he's claiming the nature of technology and industrialization is, is to be is to, is to be used for power grabs well he's just flat out wrong but i mean the heroism of this of this series is so dramatic i forgive tolkien whatever yeah, yeah he's religious he's anti-industrial you know i recognize it i disagree with him we could you know if you're alive you know uh mr Tolkien, professor tolkien we could discuss it but i but i hero worship your your books they're, they are just brilliant yeah and, and, and so so and you want to finish so, a... yeah go ahead i, I was just going to say to give a parallel, if we look at Victor Hugo, okay, Ayn Rand's yeah, favorite, right, right. you know, biggest influence in literature and probably mm -hmm. the greatest, you know, I mean, one or two, who's who's a greater novelist, Rand or, or, or Hugo? I mean, they're just towering giants. I would, I would say Ayn Rand is thing? one and Hugo is one A. That's how I, that's how I. That's okay, it. right. I, I agree personally, but there's flaws. You know, his, definitely his philosophy affected 
his novels as well. And so it's a, to me, it's the same exact thing, except that that Hugo chose to stay only in this world in his descriptions and Tolkien chose to create a, a, a fantasy world uh, with a lot of, you know, allegories and, and things of that nature. But Towering Giants, as far as the, the, the printed word and storytelling and heroism yeah, and, and the things and friendship, you know, the, that's this why, is why we love right. these guys. Right. And that's why we've had mm -hmm. them both on the hero show. John Hersey and I right. did a show with, with Shoshana yes. Milgram on Hugo. And now, you know, you and I yes. are doing on, on, on Tolkien. So you want to finish with the hobbits at the end of the two Let's finish up quickly. Was, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, a few in, the, in, in, so Frodo and Bill, uh, Frodo and Sam are with Gollum and it's back and forth. He knows he wants the ring. He's guiding them to Mordor and, um, it, they go to the black gate it's it's closed there's like a zillion yeah, orcs locked. and goblins it's and locked. These, okay. yeah black and gate like, is no, locked we can't go there what, what a shock <laughs> what a shock yeah can't yeah get exactly can't get it to so they take, the front gate right so Gollum wants to take them to another an, another way which is through uh a, this staircase and then a tunnel and on the way they uh again pivotal for me personally pivotal scene is when the, Frodo and Sam are captured by men who are wondering who these who these little hobbits are and what are they doing. They'd never seen them, and one of the men is uh, Boromir's brother, Faramir, who is a, a, a giant. He's a literal giant, and in the in in the book, and I think they played him well in the novel, uh, in mm -hmm. in the film. He says, even he, they're talking about the sword and this whole backstory, the sword that was broken. He says, even if I saw it in the middle of the street, I wouldn't pick it up. I wouldn't be tempted. Well, sure enough, five minutes later, he finds out that Frodo and Sam have the, the ring and he has a host of men in this little cave. So he could literally ca capture them and take the ring and bring it to his father who really desires it. But they tell him, or oh, it killed your brother. The ring killed your brother. And Faramir is like, Okay, um, I'll let you go. I'll, you know, and and Sam has a scene where he says he says, you know, it's you showed your your color, your quality. You showed your quality. You said you would do something, and then in the heat of the moment, you ended up doing it. And so here's integrity. If we go to virtues, Andy right. Faramir is is just a towering figure. His soul is is gigantic. Yeah, they, he's, a, you know, he's a real hero. And then when he, when they tell him where they're going through Minus Urgol, which is where Shelob is, he says, "Don't go, don't go there, don't go there." And then sure enough, that's that's the way that they go. Yeah, you want to jump in on anything not, uh, before we talk about the spider? <laughs> <laughs> no, no that's not, yeah, I was that's like going through the projects, man. Don't go, you know, don't don't go, man. That's that's da that's dangerous. That is exactly that yeah, is the yeah. danger. Yeah, especially yeah, unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately for Faramir, Denethor, the father, prefer Boromir was the favorite son, right? But, but you're, you're right. Far Faramir is Boromir dies heroic death, but Faramir is the the bigger man. He's he's the he's the greater he's the greater hero. And so yeah, yes. so to he's wrap this young... up, you want to tell the want to tell the story of Shelob? Yeah, he's Shilob, the younger son. And, and yeah, we could talk more right. about him in uh, next week because I do have a lot to say. But so Gollum brings them just... to this tunnel, Shelob's lair, which is Shelob is this big, uh, gigantic spider, captures Frodo, uh, spins him in his web, ties him up. Sam thinks he is dead and um, he's able to take Frodo. For, he, uh, Frodo's knocked out. He's not dead, but Sam thinks he is. Sam takes the ring. He takes uh, Sting, his his blade. He takes the file of Galadriel. So he has the essential tools, but he thinks Frodo's dead, and we find out that he's not uh, later on. And what, you know, one of the one of the uh, most gripping lines in all of literature for me when I finished that book it says, "Frodo was alive, but in the hands of the enemy." You know, and, and it's like, oh, you close that book and you're like, oh, wow. Because you don't know if he's actually dead uh, yet. And and then in Britain, there would be spray painted, Frodo lives, you know, like on, on the, uh, in, in the, you know, in public. And and so, yeah, that's, that's how uh, the two towers ends. Sam has 
save, you know, save the day. One of the chapters is the choices of Master Samwise. What will he do? Thinking that his master, you know, his master is dead, he has to at least try to fulfill the quest, or does he give Frodo the proper burial? And then uh, he finds out that Frodo is actually alive. So his allegiance is to getting Frodo back, uh, doing the quest uh, together, the two of them. And that's how is, that it, is it in the, is it in the two towers where they encounter Shelob and and uh, yes that's the end that's yeah, the climax yeah, and, yes. and, right and um, Frodo has the light of Galadriel which which holds which holds the beast at at bay for for a while is it, right right for a while yeah, yeah, yeah for a while but there's a lot of different entrances and they, this is their first time in this tunnel and there's cobwebs everywhere and they and they bounce off it like a like a you know like a, a rubber band and uh then only they light the file and then they cut a small hole in it and sam gets out but frodo was captured and uh it's beautifully done in you know visually it's beautifully done in the peter jackson uh film because he yeah he just can't but then Sam kills, actually, he doesn't necessarily kill, but his rage, it's kind of like Achilles, the rage of Achilles. He takes, you know, he takes on Shelob and, you know, pokes out his one eye and then the belly and, and, and then, you know, he escapes and Shelob crawls back. Uh, and, and the way Tolkien describes it is, you know, whether or not Shelob survives, this tale does not tell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, that's for someone else uh, to figure out. But yeah, that is the climactic scene in in uh in the two towers and in, in part four of the two towers imagine though like if you think th th that the way the parts are part three is everyone except sam and frodo it's all the other backstory and the, and introducing more characters and then a whole section is just sam and frodo with Gollum. then they meet faramir then they take on shilo so it's not as rich as far as the the uh, the number of scenes, but uh, okay, this is my last thing, Andy, that I that I have. At one point, when they're in the cave before they see Shelob, Sam says to Frodo, "Because Sam's a hero worshiper, and he loves old tales of heroism, good versus evil." And he says uh, to Frodo, I, "I don't have exact quotes, but basically, you know, wouldn't it be nice to know these stories if if we're living in one of these tales, you know?" And they say, you know, the, the legend of Frodo, that he succeeded. And then Frodo says, but you're leaving out a major character, Samwise. You know, you could see little children saying, tell me more, Daddy, about Sam. He makes me laugh. He's, Sam is a humor. He's the, he's the, the <laughs> definitely comic relief as far as characters go, because he's cheerful. We'll talk a lot, about, a, lot, a lot more about this next time. But he's cheerful, benevolent, wants that happy ending. And they live happily and, ever and, after the, till the end of their days. Mm -hmm. And he and he and he's wise enough, isn't he? He's the one who distrusts Gollum, Sh Shmigol or Shmigol, yes. however you say his name. Yes. he distrusts right. him, and he knows yes. he knows that creature's after the ring, and he can't be trusted. Yeah, so, and he so he's, and he's he didn't wise. trust Boromir he, earlier. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like Andy, he has a perspective on Frodo that Frodo doesn't see because Frodo just sees the quest, but Sam is protecting Frodo. So he sees when that value is in jeopardy, and this is real in real life, when we when we love somebody and we see them going down the wrong path or we see bad influences, we want to take action. We want to, you know, we want to protect them. We want to give them the, 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 the whole truth. And that's what Sam's purpose, that's his heroism in, in, right. in the novel is that, that he represents that. And so, yeah, he doesn't trust Gollum. He doesn't trust Boromir. He doesn't trust, you know, pr pretty much Strider. When he first meets Strider, he doesn't trust him. And he well, he was mistaken chance. there, but <laughs> like, it was, yeah, right. yeah, he, he was, was mistaken, mistaken but, in that case, and, but not in the other cases. He was mis But actually, it's, it's important, though, because Strider, their first encounter, Strider realizes that Sam is the right guy because that's a healthy skepticism because the Hobbits because they're so benevolent, they tend to trust everyone. But Sam is like, no, wait a minute, there's something wrong about this guy. He he feels, as Frodo says, he he feels foul, looks foul, but feels fair. <laughs> Another one of those plays on words. And because right. Aragorn right. sees how skeptical and protective uh, Sam is of Frodo, he says he's the right guy. This is the right, right. guy. If this right. quest is to succeed, it cannot without by Frodo alone. 
Mm-hmm. And, and Aragon shows his wisdom there. All right, so oh yeah, Tolkien. Yeah. Yeah, Tolkien has set the scene. <laughs> We've set the scene for Armageddon, right? The ultimate <laughs> battle between good and evil in the in the conclusion of the trilogy, Return yeah. of the King. Uh, one of my all time favorite books. And, and so next week we'll we'll discuss the the, the climax. We'll discuss uh, Tolkien's own life. The Tolkien biopic, which came out a couple of years ago, which I thought was very good. Yes. And gave real insights yep. into his life. You know, his, his mm-hmm. romance with uh, Edith, was that his, his wife's name was Edith, yes. I, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With mm-hmm. uh, uh, his, his friendship with these real artistic kids at, at prep school. C.S. Lewis. At, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, but the, the, but the kids who got killed in World War One, that, 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 yeah. um, as, as, and so we never, we never heard of you know what their artistic creativity might have been because they didn't they didn't survive the war uh but it's so nicely in in the tolkien biopic you know his friends i mean there were yeah. poets and artists and composers and everything really talented and we could discuss the horrors of war you know and what, and what it means how many brilliant lives get snuffed out young you know in, in mankind's endless warfare but all of that all of that for you know, for next week you want yeah, to make Andy, a last point? This? Just that last point that you said, you capture that perfectly in Capitalist Manifesto. I don't know if you remember, but I remember you talk about how many the human potential that is that is destroyed in wars that we can't calculate it. And sadly, since humans have existed, wars ha- have existed alongside of it, uh, mostly bad wars. And I always remember the first time reading Capitalist Manifesto that you made you made that precise point uh, about freedom versus, you know, freedom versus slavery, which eventually is, is or collectivism, which is the root of war, as Ayn Rand pointed out. So I'm glad yeah. you reminded me by just saying that that last point. Yeah, and and the Tolkien biopic shows it very poignantly. Uh, but all of that mm-hmm. for next week, when we wrap up one of the, you know, I think the man who has to be considered the greatest fantasy writer in all of literature, right? Yeah, Is I it, agree. Uh, we'll return yeah. for Return of the King next week. <laughs> Nicely said, Robert. So I want to salute. <laughs> I want to salute Tolkien and 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 your yes. contributions here, Robert, and everybody out there in Hero Land. Have a more heroic Thursday. Have a have a more lead a more heroic life. And we will see you next week on the Hero Show. Take care, everybody. Take care.